If you would turn in your Bibles today to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, we're going to be beginning our uh, scripture reading today with verse 12 as we talked down through verse 11 last week and down to our reading today will be down in chapter 2 and verse 4. And if you would please, as it's our custom, stand in honor of God's word. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they'd entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the border, the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, My, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward too Joseph called Barsabas who was also Justus and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Heavenly Father, would you empower your word today? Make the word alive to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we covered down through last week the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so after the pronouncement by the angels that were there, those two angels that appeared to them and said, why do you stand looking into heaven? And it says, go back and he will come in the same way as you saw him going to heaven. And if you remember, the instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ was for them to wait for the promise of the Father. And I kind of gave a title to the message today of waiting, prayer, and expectation. And then maybe I should have put on that added and fulfillment. Because we see all of those elements in this particular passage of Scripture, at least through the first chapter of Acts and these first verses of the book of uh, chapter 2 of Acts. But they returned to Jerusalem, we were told, to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. As he had said, as Jesus instructed in verse 4, to wait for him. And so as they go back to Jerusalem, we were told that they go back, as it says there, into an upper room. Now, is this the same upper room where they observed the last Lord's Supper? We do not know. We're not really told that. But they went up to this upper room, and there, as we see here, there are the 11 apostles that remain. They're all named right there. 
And then also it says that some, as it says there, that there were together with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now, as they return here from Olivet, and just a couple of things to note here about Olivet, the Mount of, or the Mount of Olives, we could call it. It's a place of great significance in the scriptures. There are several Old Testament references that we find there. In fact, in our study of 2 Samuel that the men just finished a few weeks ago, we came across a reference of David being in that place in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 30. There's also a reference of it in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 7 that uh, Solomon is associated with. There's also prophetic references concerning the Mount of Olives that we look at and we find in the scriptures. If you look in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4, there's a reference there. In Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 23, it's referenced there. And then there's some New Testament references that we find regarding the Mount of Olives in Christ's ministry. We're told in Matthew 21 and 1 that this is where the Christ and the disciples were uh, just prior to his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. As you remember, he rode into a, on a donkey into the city, and there was great praise given to him in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. We see in chapters 24 and 25 the Olivet Discourse in which Jesus gives prophetic teaching concerning the last days, the second coming of Christ. And then in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 30 and following those verses there, after the Lord's Supper, they lead to go to Gethsemane and this is in this area of the Mount of Olives. So it's very significant. This would be a place that, they, that would be uh, very important in the scriptures. And so what we find here is, is it says that after they leave, they go back to this upper room a Sabbath day journey. So now some of you may be wondering, what is a Sabbath day's journey? Well, it's kind of outlined over in Numbers chapter 35, verses 4 and 5. Uh, they would say in the scriptures, 2,000 cubits, which in our uh, measurements of this particular day and time would be about a half to a three-quarters of a mile as how far outside the city this Mount of Olives, the place that they gathered, was. And of course, as I said, we are given here the names here of the apostles. This is where as they were staying here, as they came to this upper room. And, and, and so they had this instruction for Jesus to wait, to wait in the city of Jerusalem. And we talked about here, this is, might have been, seemed somewhat dangerous because there were probably still those of the Jewish court that were still looking for the followers of Jesus to persecute them and perhaps even kill them uh, during this particular time. But they were obedient to Christ, and so they begin to wait. And so we're told here that they, they we, we look back, and it says that they devoted themselves, they continued, some of the translations say that they continued themselves in prayer together with those women that had been his followers, and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the brothers. Now, there's a couple of things to note here in this. As before, when Jesus had asked them to come and pray with him, when he was in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they grew weary, and they fell asleep, they could not stay awake, now they are invigorated. Now, if you remember back in John chapter 20 and verses 22 and 23, it says that Jesus breathed upon them basically the Holy Spirit. And so there seems to have been some empowering that Jesus had already given to the apostles prior to the coming, the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit upon the church. But there was this spiritual energy that they had now. And so they weren't weary. They weren't too weary to pray now. They devoted themselves to that. And so this word here means to continue, to endure, to remain, to have steadfastness. And this is one of the things that is, that is difficult, and we've talked about this before. This is one of the disciplines of the Christian life, is the discipline of prayer. And we see it in the early church. We're going to talk about some of that. But we see it in the early church, that this continuing in prayer, the people of God. And so they didn't just wait, as I said before, they didn't just sit around waiting for the, the promise of the Father to come, but they prayed. They sought God's face. 
They sought heaven, the empowering of heaven to come down upon them. And so they prayed, even though this was promised, even this was the foreordained promise of the Lord Jesus Christ that he had promised in John 14 and 15 and 16 that we looked at some time ago. Even though they knew that Christ had promised this, they, they still continued to pray. And so we're given promises in the word of God. We're given promises of God's blessing in the word of God. But that doesn't mean we just sit around. But it means that we use the means that God has given us. We need to get about busy as God's people. The church needs to be in prayer. In constant and in vigilant prayer. This is what I've said before. This is one of the difficulties in the church is getting people to pray, to come together to pray, to seek God's face. Because in honesty, it is a wearisome task sometimes. It is difficult. And yet in the meantime, when we wait upon the power of God, we wait upon salvation and those that we have prayed for, but while we're waiting, we're praying. We're not doing nothing. We're praying. And we're seeking God's face. And we see that in the early church. If you go over later over there in Acts chapter 2. And there in verse 42. And I talk about these basically as the earmarks of the early New Testament church. They first devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. Then to the fellowship. To the breaking of bread. And the prayers. They continued in prayer. They sought God's face. They recognized the necessity of going to the throne of God to see the moving of the power of God. And I think that that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why we don't see more moves of God than we do in our day and time. Because people are too busy for prayer. Or they're too weary to pray. We're wearied with many other things. And well, you know, I just don't have time for it. I don't have the energy for it. But if we we are missing out on the blessing of God, I think, when we do not do that, when we do not seek God's face. You look over in chapter 4 of Acts, and there in verse 31, and it speaks there that when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. We talked to some what there was a mention this morning about deacons and some of the qualifications there. Well, if we go over to Acts chapter 6 where we see really the institution of that, of what we call the deaconhood, we would say, There it says that as as the the twelve were summoned to take care of some of the needs of of some of the widows there, it said it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves, what? To prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so you see that in the early church, and the early church recognizes that. The apostles recognized that. The the great apostle Paul saw the necessity of prayer within the church. You look in chapter 12 of Romans, and there in verse 12, he says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And then our scripture reading this morning that we had from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. We need the prayers of God's people For the propagation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet it is the power of God to salvation. We understand that. But there needs to be a pouring out of the spirit. And an empowering upon those that speak. And that preach the word of God. We are not sufficient. I will tell you right now. I am not sufficient. I have no power. Whatever Whatever, whatever experience I may have in preaching the word or proficiency, no one is sufficient to change the hearts and the minds and the souls of men. It's not possible. And so the early church recognized this. We need the power of God is what they recognize. So we're going to go back. We're going to wait. And we are going to pray. 
And so what we will find out, of course, is that God blessed that. God, he has his purposes, he has his people, he's ordained those things, but he's also ordained the means of the pouring out of the power of God and for salvation to come and for the transformation of the souls and the lives of men and women. This is how it occurs. And so what happens here? After these, after giving themselves to prayer here, and it says in those days, Peter stood up. Peter's back. <laughs> you remember there at the end of John, he was so ashamed of Jesus that when Jesus asked him, do you agape me, he wouldn't even say agape back to the, of Jesus and answering to him. He says, I phileo you. He was so ashamed and so still, I think, injured by his denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus restored him. Jesus forgave him in that, for that. And so he's restored. He again takes this role of leadership. And of course, as we know, and Peter, I don't know if he knew this at this particular point in time, but it was Peter who later on, of course, would be empowered through the Holy Spirit to preach this great message here in Acts chapter 2, after this coming of the Holy Spirit. And so whether... And, and, and we see these, this 120 here. Now I don't think that this was all of the believers in that region. Because if you remember in our talking about the resurrection of Jesus, if you go to 1 Corinthians 15 there in about the first three or four verses, it tells us that 500 saw him alive after his resurrection there. But there were these 120 that were gathering together. And so these were... Uh, these were not all of the believers, I don't think, in Jerusalem, but this was really the core group of his followers. And so they represent, in reality, what we're saying here, the visible body, the visible church that was there at Jerusalem. As I've said before, I do not believe the day of Pentecost was the beginning of the church. It was the empowering of the church. I believe that the beginning of the church was through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and those, his followers there. And so what we find here is, is Peter begins to speak. And he said the scripture had to be fulfilled that the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And he begins to speak there what happened with Judas Iscariot, the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. Judas's act, yes, it was the act of an evil man, but it was also the fulfillment of prophecy in his in his betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was the fulfillment of the inerrant word of God. If you go back at Psalm 41 and 9, it speaks there uh, concerning of Judas' betrayal. It was, it, was, it was a foreordained event. It was a prophesied event. God, Judas, as we talked about before, when he did this, he did not act against his will, but his evil actions fulfilled Scripture. In Psalm 41 and 9, it says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And so Peter is just saying there, this is a fulfillment of, of that prophecy of what Judas did there in that place. And as we understand, when we look, at, and this is one of the things I believe that proves that this is the inerrant and authoritative word of God. As you go back to the Old Testament and you see prophecy after prophecy after prophecy and the fulfillment of these things, these things didn't just happen. These were not a bunch of coincidences. These were not men colluding together. It would have been very difficult to collude together because they all lived hundreds uh, and thousands of years apart in this. It was the moving of the Holy Spirit, the mind of God speaking through his prophets. Uh, the apostle P and the apostle Peter talked about this because there were those I'm sure even during Peter's day. Well, this is just a bunch of made up stories, but Peter debunked that. Peter stated strongly over in chapter one of Second Peter verses nineteen through twenty one. He says, "We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts." Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Get that. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so Peter gives credence to this. He says, this was spoken by the Holy Spirit there through David. David not only was a king, but he was a prophet. He prophesied this. And so 
Peter says this is the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. And so we could go back to the scriptures uh, here and talk about the, the betrayal of, of Judas, but we, we've already spoken of that very recently. But he counts here, he says he became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. If you remember the story that Judas took, the 30 pieces of silver, he betrayed uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew where Christ and the apostles would be on that night. He led those of the, of the Jewish court and the Roman soldiers to that place. He was one who was, was very complicit in that. He did it very willingly for the love there of power, for the love of money, that he did that. But we are all familiar with that. And then later on we'll talk about here in this scripture about he became to regret that. He repented, but it wasn't a repentance. It wasn't a true biblical repentance. It was a, a, a repentance over his actions, over, over his guilt over his actions. It wasn't a true repentance. And it just validates the fact, and we see this in the scripture, that there are those that sometimes that, Will be ser- we, we see them as servants in the body of Christ or in the church that are deceivers. That are deceivers. And we see that and the scripture talks about. There are those in the church, there are those in service who are deceivers, who are workers of darkness, who are workers of iniquity. And the apostle Paul talked about this over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, in years past I've known of people that I thought were very staunch and strong Christians, and it turned out that they were deceivers. They were ones that came in to destroy the church, to cause division in the church, to hinder, not to help the work of God, but to hinder the work of God. In 2 Corinthians 11, there in verses 13 through 15, the Apostle Paul wrote this, He said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. There are those that come within the church sometimes, and this is how I believe that Satan does his work to try to destroy the church, is to put in false teachers, false professors that may speak and may use the same kind of language that you and I do concerning the doctrines of the Word of God, but inside they are full of darkness, and at their heart is the desire of, Uh, of the flesh and the desire not for the gain of the church and the growth of the church but for their own gain and basically in the end to destroy the church and we see this and we see it there are many false teachers and oh if you get over into first john um, as i've done some study concerning the second coming because that's what i'm teaching in sunday schools is that there antichrist the spirit of antichrist was already present within the church john said he could spot it and so we see that even in our day Is it not evident in our day that there are those that stand up and are preaching like me this morning, but the message that they preach, you can tell that they are deceivers. They are not preachers of righteousness. They are not preachers of the glory of God, but glory of self and appealing to the flesh of men. Those are false prophets. Those are false apostles. False teachers come into the church. But... He says here he was numbered with us in verse 17. He was allotted his share in the ministry. And so he said after basically his his betrayal, it says this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, the 30 pieces of silver, and he hung himself. We know that. We know that he did hang himself. And he says that he fell, and he says he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. Man, mm. Uh, that's sometimes, boy, that's that's like a PG rating on the scriptures, isn't it, to think about that. It was a horrid death, but he died a betrayer's death. He died a betrayer's death. He died the ultimate betrayer's death. And the money that he took back to those uh, that he had received it from, 
they bought this blood money, and it was called this place that they bought in the pot, what they called a, a, a potter's field. There it, is, it says that it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood, coming from what happened to Judas Iscariot as he had killed himself and what happened in that place. Now, if you want to know what that place was, as we, as we look at that, it's at what we call the east end and southern slope of the Valley of Hinnom. Now, the Valley of Hinnom is not a blessed place. If you look in, in the Valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna, as it's also called, it was a place during the days of King Ahaz and King Manasseh where they, in honor of the, of the god Molech, Sacrifice children. They gave themselves over to the sacrifice of these idols in the sacrifice of children in this place. And so later on, what we find is that during this particular day and time, is what I have been told in my research seems to, seems to say, is that this basically they turned it into a trash dump. And there was a fire there that burned all the time. And people that couldn't afford, that died and couldn't afford to be buried, they dumped their bodies in this place. It was a reprehensible place uh, where, nearby where this, where this was bought and where this was done. And so as it became known to all of these, and, and as it says here that it, this was also prophesied, it is written in the book of the Psalms, Peter said, may his camp become desolate, let there be no one to dwell in it. That's found in Psalm 69 and 25, and let another take his office. That's in Psalm 109 and 8. It's a horrid sentence upon him, but it, it, the, the punishment fits the crime in this particular point in time is what we see here. And so it says, as they say, since he is gone now, what Peter says is taking the lead again. He says, we need to replace Judas. We need another apostle. Now, the means by which they go about this, I don't know uh, if I would recommend this. They used the casting of lots, <laughs> rolling the dice, so to speak. Uh, there's a, one of the Proverbs, uh, I believe it's in uh, Proverbs chapter 16, and there in verse 33 that talks about the, the rolling of the dice. And, and in that Solomon writes this, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And so what Peter says, we've got these two that were followers of Christ from the earliest times. He says from the beginning, from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And so they put forward the two, Barsabas and Matthias. And so he says, Lord, you know the hearts of all. He says, we're going to, we have these two and we're going to cast lots. And whichever one that you want, he said, then let the lot fall upon him. And so it fell upon Matthias. And it says he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, I've, I've thought about this from time to time uh, uh, because pa the apostle Paul, of course, we know, was the, called himself an apostle. He was uh, apostle, he said, born out of due time, saved on the road to Damascus. Uh, did the apostles get ahead of themselves? Was this a case where Peter kind of got ahead of himself and should have waited on the Lord to choose an apostle to replace Judas Iscariot? I don't know, but they went ahead and did it. And I think that this was, I'm sure, very, very likely a godly man who had been with them through all of this and had witnessed the resurrection and the ascension and all of these things, and this is what happens. But we do know that Paul, in various places in the Scripture, calls himself an apostle. He was God's apostle, I know, but I'm sure that this man was used in the service of the Lord in all of this. But, so what do we find here? So we found that they've waited. They've prayed. They have expectation. And now the culmination of all of that comes. And so it says when the day of Pentecost arrived or fully came. This is the narrative of the empowering of the Christian church that Christ had established. And so as we said, Christ had promised the paraclete the helper, the comforter, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, that not only is he with you, he told the apostles, but he shall be in you. And what I said at that point in time is I don't know if they completely understood what that meant. But it was now the 50th day. Passover came. 
50 days. This was the completion of 50 days after Passover, the completion of the seven weeks. Uh, and the Jews were now on this day celebrating Pentecost, the second day of the festivals. Of, there's this, the second, there were three festivals that, that there were. And under the Mosaic law, there was the Passover and the festival of tabernacles or trumpets. And under the Mosaic law, it was known, this one is the Feast of Weeks. It was known as the Feast of Weeks. If you were to go back to Leviticus chapter 23, and I'm going to read that for you just for context there in verses 15 and 16. Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16. And he says, You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. And it says, You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And so this is what this was a celebration of, this, this Pentecost, the feast. It's also called really the Feast of Harvest uh, over in Exodus 23 and 16. And so the day of first fruits, Leviticus chapter 23, verses 17 through 22. And then we have these loaves that are presented here on the altar. Now approximately there had been 1,500 Pentecost approximately before this. But never in the way that it was about to occur here on that particular day. Now let me say this. In the Jewish calendar, there may be the day of Pentecost, but don't pray as a Christian for another coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost like this one. There's only been one. There will only be one coming of the anointing and the baptizing on the, of the church upon Pentecost. This is it. There's not a second Pentecost. There's not a second blessing. Let me state that clearly. There is not a second blessing. There's the first blessing. Because God gave all of it on this day. He poured out his power upon this day. Now some have asked, why was it on this day that the Holy Spirit would baptize and empower the church? Well, for one thing, it's when God said so. It was, the, it was in the sovereign power and determination of God. He had appointed that. But some have speculated about some things. First of all, they've said, well, perhaps it's because the completion of the seven weeks typifies the full completion of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our atonement. So, and that perhaps that typified the end of the law, the end of the old covenant, and the beginning of a new dispensation or the beginning of the new covenant. Also, by Jewish tradition, it was recounted that the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai on this particular day. And so that this also typified the mark of the end of the old dispensation and the beginning of the new dispensation. Some, some look at, at the harvest itself uh, in Leviticus 23 and 22 where it talks about when you, when you uh, go out and you reap that you leave the edges there for the stranger and the sojourner which would perhaps some say speak now that the harvest, the giving of, the, of God and, and the fruits of salvation are not just for the Jews, but they are also for the sojourner and the stranger who would be us, <laughs> Gentiles. And, 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 and those things are spoken of, and, and, and there seems to be some, some credence to that given by the Apostle Paul when he talks about over in Ephesians, the middle wall of partition being broken down for us, and now that we are included in the promises of the grace of God in the new covenant as the children of God. And so that the blessings of God are no longer reserved just for the children of Israel, the ethnic children of Israel, but are for Gentiles as well. And then some have said that, that the offering of the loaves typifies that one loaf speaks of the Jews and one loaf speaks of the Gentiles. Perhaps that speaks again there of this bringing in of the new covenant. But needless to say, uh, this was when the Lord said that it is going to come. And so Christ's sacrifice has been, is about to be spoken of here. And it says, as it says here, when the day of 
Pentecost arrived, they were all in one place. And, you know, the scripture speaks of Christ speak when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the scriptures talk about here. When it arrived, when it was fully come is really probably a better translation, when it had been filled completely. And it was not as we know, not in the, it was in the third hour of the day. It was about 9 a.m. And it says they were all in one accord in one place. You look at verses 12 through 14, it talks about them being in one accord. You look in chapter 2 and verses 46, it talks about them being in one accord. Let me tell you something. It's hard to find a church anymore that's all in one accord. The farther that we've gotten away from this particular day and time. One of the things that we pray for and that we desire as a church is to be in one accord, to be in unity, one with another. And this is what they were doing. They were in one accord. And we, this is the unity of the body through the Spirit of, of God and the love of God. When a church is filled with the Spirit of God, we're not going to have, like I said, we're not going to have another Pentecost, but when a church is filled with the Spirit of God and the love of God, there is unity. Every man's not looking out for what he can get out of the church. He's looking out for the glory of God, for the glory of Christ, and for the needs of others. He puts every man, as Paul said there, as he talked about in Philippians 2, put your own interest above everybody else. And when there is the filling of the Spirit in the church of God, and there's the love of Christ abounding, you're going to have one accord. You're going to have that. And this is what they were. They were in one accord. They were praying together. They were seeking God in this place. And it says suddenly, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Unawares. Unexpectedly. And let me say, this was not some natural phenomenon. This was not some thunder, East Texas thunderstorm or tornado that blew in. And notice here, it doesn't say that there was a mighty rushing wind that came through. It says a sound like a mighty rushing wind. The coming of the Holy Spirit came with this sound suddenly. It really means literally, a, it, it, it was like a violent wind came into their midst, but there was no wind. It was the sound like it. They knew that something was occurring. And we know that the Holy Spirit has been likened to wind in the past in the scriptures. If you go back to Ezekiel chapter 37. In Ezekiel there, it says that he was in a valley of dry bones. And you look there in verses 9 and 10 where it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me. Ezekiel says, He brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord. Man, I'd love for the... The, the Spirit of the Lord to bring me out every time I come to this pulpit. And he set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. Now can you imagine being brought out to some place, to a valley? He says, okay, start preaching to these dry bones. What on earth? Preach to a bunch of dry bones. God, do you know what you're doing? He always does. <laughs> And the Spirit of the Lord, it says, he, he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were not just dry, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And he answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. That was the right answer. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, the sound of the Spirit. The sound of the power of God. And then after the sound, there started being a, a rattling. And you hear those dry bones rattling. 
And it's the bones came together. This was a bunch of disjointed bones, but they started coming together. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet and exceedingly great army God brought, brought the breath he brought the spirit he brought life and this is what, what Christ was doing here he was bringing power and life into the church he brought it here and pretty soon Peter was going to be preaching to a bunch of dry bones at least 3,000 that were dead men walking, spiritually dead, that had called for the crucifixion of Christ. But the power of the Spirit of God comes into the church and it comes upon the Apostle Peter. And it says here, that it says they, it filled that entire house where they were sitting. And the divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled. Not some of them, but they were all filled. And what a great thing that would be to have a whole church of people that are all filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, we're all, com we're all commanded, not just the preachers and the teachers, but we're all commanded as believers to be filled with the Spirit. That's not a request, by the way, that Paul makes. It's a command. But the Holy Spirit comes there. This rushing, mighty wind, as, it's, as he says. But it was born from heaven by God himself. And these tongues, some have said, well, what does that, what does that represent? What is, the, what is the appearance of fire? The fire here, it really, some have said, it, 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 what does it speak of there? The Spirit gives light as fire. The Spirit illuminates the heart. The Spirit illuminates the mind to be able to understand, to awaken to the spiritual condition, the spiritual things. But, but you know, before believers, their foolish heart was darkened. These 3,000 that Peter began to preach to over there, here in a few verses, he begins to preach Christ to them. And all of a sudden, those people that had not listened to Christ, that would had rejected Christ, suddenly the power of the Holy Spirit is unleashed in the apostle Peter and the word of God becomes alive to them. They are regenerated. They are given life. And this is what happened on this day. This is why Jesus said, wait. Don't get in a hurry. Don't try to do your own thing. But wait. The Holy Spirit of God comes. And it says the apostle Peter and you, you look at this sermon and all he does is preach the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to do. The Apostle Paul said, preach Christ and him crucified. I came not in my own wisdom, my own ability, but I came and I preached Christ that your faith should stand in the power of God, in the power of this Holy Spirit that God poured out upon the church on this day. And when Peter did that, let me tell you something. He didn't need an altar call. They all cried out to him. <laughs> it says when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, this is down in verse 37, Brothers, what shall we do? I can imagine that it was much like on the day when Jonathan Edwards preached the sermon Sinners in the Hands of, the angry, of an Angry God and it said that there were people that were just falling out of the aisles crying out to God. And I can imagine the crescendo of these 3,000 suddenly all crying out, What must we do? What must we do? And what Peter says, Repent be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit repent repent the repentance is something that happens in the heart the baptism is outward to show your 
confession of the Lord Jesus Christ there. And those 3,000 were saved. And then later on we read about 5,000 more that are saved. And in other places we're just saying it just says many. <laughs> Multitudes were being saved. The Holy Spirit came upon the church in this day. And the world has never been the same. Praise God. Because the Holy Spirit came upon the church, guess what? You and I are here today. Because we have believed through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the moving and the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, men and women, children are transformed. That darkened mind that we talked about this morning in the Sunday school, whoosh, it is gone. And now it is a, a mind filled with the light of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't tell me that you've been born again, that you've been born by the power of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and you're the same person that you were beforehand. Don't tell me that. We're transformed by this. This is why Jesus said, wait. He knew what was coming. And this is what we do. And this is still why we believe in the power of God. There have been periods of time in the history of the world where God has manifested himself in special times of reviving and movings of the Spirit of God. I want to see something of that. I want to see something of that in Faith Baptist Church. I want to see something of that in Longview, Texas. And if God wills beyond that. But it comes. If it comes, it will be God doing it. And I believe if it comes, I believe also in the human instrumentation, the human part of this, that it comes because God's people get burdened about it and they start praying with one accord in the church. Asking God, God, may your power fall upon me. May it fall upon those that preach your word. And may we see the salvation of souls and the transformation of lives and the transformation of the church. That's what the moving of God is all about. The glory of God. The salvation of souls. Living lives that glorify him. As the scripture says, to God be glory in the church. And that's what we desire. That's what we want. Is for God to be glorified in our midst. And to see a moving of the spirit of God here. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again. For the power of your word. We thank you again, Father, for the moving of the spirit of God. We pray that we might see great manifestations of this. Lord, help us to be diligent and to be in one accord in seeking this, that your name may be glorified in the earth. In your holy name we pray.